Hi, everybody. I'm Traven Rice, and I'm the arts and culture editor and co-founder of The Lowdown. And I'm so excited today. I will be talking with Nikki Russ Fetterman. She's the co-owner of the famed appetizing shop Russ and Daughters. Um, we're here at PNT Knitwear, and this podcast is um, devoted to culture changers and all different ways and means um, that are based here on the Lower East Side. So I am going to introduce Nikki. Um, she is a fourth generation co-owner of Russ and Daughters, the famed Lower East Side shop located on East Houston. And it's just around the corner right here. We're on Orchard Street here at the studio. And they also have a cafe that opened just down the street, also on Orchard Street. And the landmark appetizing shop, which is 109? Yeah, next year's our 110th anniversary. That's amazing. Just 109 years old. Is known for the best bagels, lox, caviar, herring, babka, and other traditional baked goods and smoked fish that you can find in the city. Opened in 1914 as a pickled herring purveyor. The store is at 179 East Housen Street, passed to the fourth generation, Nikki Russ Fetterman and her cousin, Josh Rush Tupper, in 2009. Correct. So you, you did your homework, Traven. But I know you know most of this from just being a fixture of the Lower East Side. Yes. And 2009 is when we started the lowdown. That's right. And I have to say, I'm so happy to be that, be here, one, because, well, primarily, I've been such a huge fan of yours and what you and your husband, Ed, have done with the lowdown for so long. And you've been chronicling the, and telling the stories of just the, the richness of the Lower East Side with such journalistic integrity and just personal passion that I... It was like I think I thought for half a second to you know whether to say yes or not. There was I mean oh. there was no question. I was delighted. To, I appreciate that so here. much. I mean, um, and we've been big fans even since before the lowdown, obviously. But it was really interesting because we were getting going, and when we met, I think when you came in, it was just the appetizing shop. Yes, right. For literally a hundred years, Russ and Daughters was the OG appetizing shop on East Houston Street. Yeah, and um, I came back into the business around two thousand six, and um, you know it was about a three year transition period for my parents to officially, um, you know, uh, retire, and uh, and then. My cousin Josh and I opened Russell's Daughters Cafe in 2014, which just happened to be our 100th anniversary. That was, there was no grand plan, but it worked out really nicely. That's amazing. So that's an amazing history, obviously. Um, I just wanted to say, too, I, it just meant so much when we met your father, um, when we were, we were doing a print version of the magazine. I remember that. And we Back had, when print was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And we had you guys on the cover when you were opening that cafe. It was a cover story. Um, and it was so sweet because your father was, when we met, he said, oh, we love the lowdown. And he said, we finally have our own newspaper. <laughs> it just meant a lot. He just meant like us in the neighborhood and, you know. Well, there is, the tr there is a tradition and a real history of newspapers and journalism coming out of the Lower East Side mm -hmm. with the Yiddish Forward um, so I feel like you just, you know, you're you're part of a whole, you know, legacy. Yeah, def definitely. Um, so yes, we've had a great, it's been a great mutual good relationship. And we've really, so obviously the neighborhood's changed. Um, and you guys have really grown. I was, that's what I was saying, just like, you just had the shop and now look at you. Yeah. So now, <laughs> I have this note here too. Um you guys, you and Josh, own and run Russ and Daughters, the shop right here, the flagship, um, the cafe, which is wonderful. Uh, and then there's a, a bakery. At, there's a spot at the Jewish Museum. There's a spot at um, yeah, the Navy Yard. There's um, Yeah, so Russ and Daughters Brooklyn is our space in, in, in Brooklyn, um, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, but it's open to the public and um, unlike our 
shtetl tenement spaces on the Lower East Side, um, you know, which are very tiny. In Brooklyn, we have the luxury of having a very large space, and that's where we have our main bakery. But we also have an, an appetizing counter, so we have customers mm-hmm. based in Brooklyn going there, and we sh- that's where our shipping facility is. We ship around the country from Ross and Daughters, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And then we ha- we during COVID, we did close, or well, we didn't reopen Ross and Daughters at the Jewish Museum. Oh, um, right, right, Yeah, right. that was right. one of our, you know, COVID, our only real COVID casualty. Mm-hmm. Um, that's right. Luckily, uh but we, as of just a few months ago, we opened um, in Midtown on the west side. So we have Russ and Daughters on 34th Street and 10th Avenue. That's amazing. So right on the edge of Hudson Yards. Correct. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Congrats on all of that. So, okay, let's go back a little bit because there's a long way to go back in this neighborhood in the same exact location. Mm-hmm. So talking about what's changed and also, um, I mean, it seems to me, even today, the name and daughters on a business is is not the norm. It's unusual. Still, in 2023, it is not common to see and daughters. And Russ and Daughters is actually the first business in this country with and daughters in its name. So my great-grandfather, who started it, um, he opened his shop in 1914. It had some other names originally, but in 1935... Um, by that point, he had roped in his three daughters to help him because in typical sort of immigrant resourcefulness, he looked at his family. He didn't have sons. He had daughters. And they were, by that point, all working in the shop. And he changed the name to Russ and Daughters. And not only that, he made his daughters his partners. So all of that was incredibly unheard of and quite controversial at the time. He got a lot of pushback from the public who thought, you know, why would you ruin your, you know, your reputable business with your with this name? Other people just assumed that there was a Mr. Russ and a Mr. Daughters. <laughs> um, so, and you know, I like to think of him in my mind as a as a pioneering feminist, but I also <laughs> am realistic. And if he had had a son, it probably would have been Russ and Sons. Yeah, it was. I think I had heard a little bit of of you say something about it. Might have been a bit of a begrudge. You know, he was a bit, a little bit of a. Uh, okay, this is what I have to work with. <laughs> yeah, I, this is what he had to work with. I think there were also the Lower East Side alone was full of appetizing stores, just mm-hmm. like his. So and push cards and push cards and you know, this was not a. Now we're you know almost one of a kind, but back then just. This neighborhood alone had 30, at its peak, had 30 other appetizing stores like him. So he had to also, um, in you know, differentiate and stand out. And I think he realized that Russ and Daughters was a way to stand out with that name. Yeah. Yes. And so and that brings me a little bit to this other piece. I mean, we've, we've seen you all over the news in different areas being profiled, but um, there was a lovely documentary called The Sturgeon Queens, and that was made, uh, it's on PBS now, about Russ and Daughters. And how, what was that experience like? Oh. And that documents your, grand, your, your grandmothers. It, it your, documents the your, whole family. And, um, and both my family and the family of, you know, our, many of our customers, many well-known customers, many sort of like local people. Um, and it was a... An incredible experience. Um, Julie Cohen is the director, and um, she actually the, the 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 movie opens up with um, an interview with Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was a lifelong customer of ours. And um, I've seen this film forty times <laughs> at this point, uh, and it gets me every time because RBG is talking about how growing up, her family came from the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. And when she would come to visit, she would stand in front of the store, and she said, before I knew the word feminist, seeing the name Russ and Daughters taught me that women could matter in an enterprise, just the way men do. I'm basically Mm -hmm. quoting her. Um, And gosh, I mean, that's just so powerful. 
And in an interesting bit of uh, uh, trivia, um, we, you know, introduced Julie Cohn, the director, to RBG, and they connected by doing this interview. Julie Cohen then went on to make the documentary RBG uh-huh. because of that. Um, so I'd like to think that, you know, Russ and Daughters in some ways helped to win an Academy Award. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. I didn't remember that, that little piece of it. I mean, I know over the years you've had many sort of valued larger you know scale family members but I but what I mean by that is like a, a big community of well-known people that have gone on that had started in the Lower East Side and they have just always loved Russ and Daughters there's a lot of artists and musicians and poets and writers food writers um and people like RGB and on and on I, I mean I like to say that um there's that saying all roads lead back to Rome but for me all roads lead back to the Lower East Side and Russ and Daughters has been the sort of continuous, has had a continuous presence on the Lower East Side and has been part of the lives of so many generations of people. And so on a daily basis, I talk to people, you know, you mentioned Russ and Daughters, and almost everyone has a story. And the story is typically, you know, a memory of someone's grandmother or living on the Lower East Side or how the family back in the day had a, a you know, a shop or a push cart um, similar to what my, you know, my ancestors did. There's just, there's this, these few square blocks just really loom so large in the, the, the life and the evolution of so many Americans. And there's yeah. just so much, like, it's creative... Part of- um, energy that has come from the experience of this neighborhood. Yeah, I was going to say part of the fabric almost. And it really is like threading this history and continuing. And it's just generational, which is amazing to me. What are your memories, your early memories of being in the shop and when you were growing up? Yeah, I grew up a shop kid because my parents ran the shop for 30 years. And so I, even though I'm, you know, I'm in my mid-40s, I um, People will sometimes say, oh, you don't remember what the Lower East Side used to be like. But I do because I grew (laughs) up, you know, spending so much of my time being really bored and frustrated waiting for my parents to work and, I mean, to finish work. And so I would, you know, walk up and down Orchard Street when Orchard Street was full of life on the street, you know, the the fabric stores and the button stores and, you know, like there was still sort of a merchant presence on the actual street and sidewalk. Um, uh, I would get, I mean, this is, I'm talking about like young, I would get sent on uh, little jobs to like go pick up a roll of quarters from, you know, the bakery next door or we, well, we ran out of ice gels. Like, go get some from Katz's. Or yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were a couple, good few decades um, when you were growing up, I imagine, specifically, when this neighborhood wasn't that safe. It wasn't known the way it is now. Absolutely not. I, I remember driving in with my parents and coming, we lived in Brooklyn, and driving up Allen Street and then turning the corner on to East Housen Street and the the median of both of those avenues was just, back in the day, full of, you know, there was a lot of homelessness. There were fires being burned in garbage cans. There was a lot of, like, just drug use, you know, everywhere. It was the 80s, so lots of punk, you know, uh, mohawks. And um, it was, there was a grit to it, which as a kid was a little, I remember kind of, slinking down in the car, you mm-hmm. know, because it was a little scary to me. Uh, it was certainly not easy for my parents to be small business owners in the neighborhood at the time because mm-hmm. so many of um, their customers had already left the neighborhood mm-hmm. and didn't necessarily want to come back. Um, many people would leave, they would drive in from, you know, Long Island or the upper east side or wherever and they would leave their cars running and just run in and get their you know provisions from the shop and run out you know there was not a um 
it was it was a hard time. I, my there was a lot of crime. Yeah. Um, and I remember some customers would give my my father especially grief and say, like, "Why are you making us come back to the Lower East Side? Like you should." Move, move the store, move to where your customers are. Yeah. And my father had the, well, rightly so, said, eventually Uptown is going to come downtown. I think he really understood the power of place mm-hmm. and the power of staying in place. Because as much as the Lower East Side has changed, Russ and Daughters is one of those few place, you know, uh, continuous It's an anchor. anchor. Yeah. <laughs> it's still there. Yeah. Which gives it character, which adds to the character, which keeps it authentic. It's really smart. So, I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of lean times, probably a roller coaster, I would imagine, up and down throughout the decades. And then were you, were you um, encouraged not to, not to <laughs> run a shop? You went to college. I went, went, to, away. I went to college. I, I got, you know, I had a really great education um, and you studied? I studied political science in political school, science. but I went and, you know, my first job was working at uh, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Like, I was always kind of drawn to either sort of the international relations world or the arts and culture world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I was encouraged to do anything but, <laughs> although I, my father, sec- not so secretly, always wished or hope that I would come into it. I think he always saw me as kind of cut from the same cloth as him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did grow up with kind of an innate appreciation for... I understood from a very young age that there was there was magic in this small shop. And um, But that must have been something that was cultivated by your family. I mean, that's... That's not how everybody feels when they're growing up in a shop sometimes. And so it's just, it seems to me like there's got to be some interesting, I'm sure you've thought about it or talked about the secrets of this sustainability because it really did go from one of many a hundred years ago, something that was very common, um, like a, not like a bodega, but as common as some, some regular shop you would go to right. here in the neighborhood to then sustaining and then just more and more less, less sh- other types of shops and just hanging in there to, to now one of a kind. And so it went from something very common and familiar to, I mean, I really would say it's very iconic now. And so I don't know what, what do you think that is? What are those things that, you know, kind of enable that to happen? I think it's the um, the interplay and the the co this kind of coexistence of maintaining continuity and trying to keep the essence of something as true to its original form as you can. So trying to keep Russ and daughters the. Sh- the the, the look of it, the store, the smells, the foods, the way we make things, the way we wrap them, the you know the whole experience as consistent, so that when you're you know biting into um, a babka, it it reminds you of the babka you had thirty years ago, for example, right? At the same time, stagnation is death, so it's also about how do you keep this moving forward, keep staying relevant, feeling like it's not a stodgy museum, um, that it's you're in the moment, and it, that it can appeal to the generation now and the you know future generation. And I think for us, the fact that it, there's been at least four times now someone from the family who... Um, and now my cousin and I, so there's two of us who've chosen to take this on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what what was on your mind? Like, what were your hopes and fears when you decided to come back and, and jump in and help run it? I think it was the realization that I could do both of those things that I just described. That mm-hmm. I understood the 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 gift that I had to be the steward of this this kind of this tradition, this jewel that means so much to so many people and 
is so much of a fabric piece of the of the neighborhood and the city. And I could also um, imbue it with my own ideas and um, entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, in a way that speaks to me and hopefully, you know, a lot of people today. So I think it was recognizing it didn't have to be either or. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That, and, and whose idea was it a hundred years after a hundred years? To say maybe it's time to have a, a sit down cafe. Yeah, rest, the restaurant was it was not a master plan. It was it felt very organic, um, born out of just a a real need because increasingly people were coming into the OG store, and I mean some like people would literally just like walk through the store into the back into our kitchen because they just assume that that's where the the (laughs) tables and seats were um and uh and or we'd get just you know more and more calls uh for people looking to make a reservation for four or for five you know and and so we had to explain no this is just a store and we have some metal benches outside that you can sit on you know so the a sit-down restaurant felt just like an, uh, a natural extension of the shop. Mm-hmm. People wanted to eat Russ and Daughters at Russ and Daughters, and we didn't have a way to do that until we opened Russ and Daughters Cafe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I like that that there's a three-minute walk between the shop and then down Orchard Street to mm-hmm. the cafe. Um which wasn't the original plan. Originally, oh. you know, we thought, like, let's try to get them as close to possible, you know, close to each other as possible. Um, but that didn't work out, and I'm glad it didn't, because I do really think that there's something that it, part of the experience is walking down Orchard Street. Mm-hmm. A lot of times people go from the cafe to the store or vice versa. Mm-hmm. And in those three minutes, you're kind of anchored in the in the neighborhood you can look up and you still see these tenement buildings. Mm-hmm. Um, and people, a lot of people come to Russell Daughters because they can trace their, you know, their family history mm-hmm. through these streets. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, you know, Russell and Daughters is as much a part of the Lower East Side as the Lower East Side is part of Russell and Daughters. Definitely. And I know you also from the... T- from the time you opened the cafe, you guys have had um, very lovely musical events, holiday events. You just had one last night. I know. I'm a little tired. We just had a, our Hanukkah party last night. It was so fun. That we packed, the room was packed with like 100 people. And um, it was just really joyous, um, especially with everything going on in the world, to just literally bring some light and... Um, and music, and I mean, obviously, lots of latkes and <laughs> jelly donuts. I know. But, I think a couple of years you've had uh, Laurie Anderson has has. Um, yeah, there have and, been some amazing um, people who've performed at the cafe. Uh, John Zorn, another downtown legend, um, is is also a a sort of Russ and Daughters diehard to the point where he over the counter one day while I was helping him offered to play. He knew I was getting married and he offered to play at my wedding and I thought he was kidding and he wasn't kidding. Um, And he also has, I don't even remember how it happened if, if I asked him or he just took it upon himself, but he, we, we've done a whole music series called the stone series in honor of the stone, which was the famed music venue that um, he ran. And, um, John curates it, which literally means he sits down at his favorite booth right. in the restaurant and just, you know, in a few hours makes a bunch of calls while he's eating um, his food. And then we have the whole season mapped out and we've had just incredible, incredible musicians play right um, in this tiny, you know, 70 seat restaurant. Yeah. So how do you feel about the state of the neighborhood now? You know... <laughs> I th- I think the Lower East Side is always changing. 
And New York City in general is always changing. Um, I, you know, people still like think nostalgically about the Lower East Side of whatever era is, you know, meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. People still talk about, oh, when Ratner's was here, you know, the famed (laughs) Jewish dairy restaurant, which closed like, you know, maybe 30 years ago at this point. Yeah. Um, Or, oh, I remember when, you know, in the 80s and there were so many artists and like cool happenings going on here. And, but, you know, each, each decade of the, this neighborhood's life has its, um, you know, pros and cons. I think right now the neighborhood is this, you don't have to explain what the Lower East Side is anymore. Um, do I think that there are, there's a, there are a lot of excuse kind of towards nightlife and, um, weed shops <laughs> very, yes. very recently recently um yes i do but there's also like places like pnt knitwear you know there's a bookstore um on the neighborhood there's um you know these still like these small business experiences whether it's clothing stores or um you know the the hardware store that's also family run or, so i i think I think one one similarity throughout the life of this neighborhood has been this kind of way these small shops have been engines of um, of, of opportunity, and there's a there's a hustle and a grit to the people who come here and set up shop here and make a life here mm-hmm. that has been there and. Is still here, and I really like that. And for me, it feels important. When when um, Josh and I, my cousin and I, were thinking about opening a restaurant, I have to admit, we did. Our first thought was not to open the restaurant on the Lower East Side. We thought, well, we've been on the Lower East Side for a hundred years. We should we should open in any other neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And we were looking at spaces in in Soho and in Tribeca and in Chelsea and Mm -hmm. um and we actually were on the cusp of signing a lease for a space in Chelsea oh and it was literally the night before and I started to have second doubts and I and I started talking to my husband about this saying I don't know this does not this just doesn't feel right and at that moment, Josh called me and mm-hmm. said, I don't know, this just doesn't feel right. And we started talking about it, and it crystallized for us that the restaurant had to be on the Lower East Side, that we were going about this completely all wrong because so much of Russ and Daughters is about this neighborhood, and because this neighborhood is changing so much, mm-hmm. we felt, we realized that we have an obligation to actually maintain our presence and even expand our presence so that as much as things change some things stay the same but also people have a place to go back to Mm -hmm. and after that it just became very clear and we only started looking at spaces here in the neighborhood oh that's amazing yeah wow so you were right on the brink there literally it was the (laughs) night before that's not an exaggeration Yeah, that would have been very different. Very different. Yeah. Well, we're very glad that you're here. (laughs) I am too. It's a lot easier just to walk up and down Orchard Street. Yeah. And then, but and then since then, we mentioned you've you've expanded. Now you are in some other neighborhoods, and not only that. I mean, I was at the airport uh, recently, and and everywhere I look is so some of those new restaurants at LaGuardia, just just the design and sort of the trends and the the um, interior design of what you see reflects what you guys have been doing for a hundred years. It's really on trend right now. I would say it's like it only feels like it's becoming more and more so which is really interesting. And I know you have a lot more things happening down the road. There's a TV show. There's a, uh, 
there is a scripted TV show that's in the works right now. That's amazing. Which is wild. So the Lower East Side will, you know, is literally a, a character, you know. That's amazing. And I know you're starting to do some things with some fashion and branding and Yeah, we've had we've had fun with that. Um we did a sneaker collab. So there was a Russ and Daughter sneaker sneaker. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I have to see a that. Pu- a Puma um, one of the Clyde I have to see that. Yeah, shoes um, we did with Puma and we just did a collection of uh, leather bags with Echo leather and <laughs> I should have brought mine actually. Um, they're so they're so great and um, really like all the touches kind of evoke the store, the colors, things like you know, it comes in capers, caviar, creme fraiche, <laughs> uh, Russ and blue, the the details and the zippers are like the take a number tickets. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So we, you know, it's, it, it's fun. And also kind of, if I take, if I take a step back and I think about the ways in which Russ and Daughters has kind of seeped into the cultural zeitgeist, it's really kind of amazing. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, we go home to Denver. My husband and I both have family there. And we, for the holidays and different events, we bring rest daughters with us because you can pack it up to travel. We bring delicious things to eat on special occasions whenever we can. We're always in the shop to bring, you know, let's go get some wonderful smoked fish. And now the caviar. The caviar has been a, a big a big thing, right? Yeah, it has. Um, you know, 100 years ago, you know, my great-grandfather and the other Poor Jews of Lori side were not eating caviar, but I think it's become we're one of the you know top purveyors of caviar, and um, it's one of those you know we always will need moments to mark important life events and ways to do that. And food is really one of the core, most kind of primal ways that we can um, connect ourselves to. Um, it's so evocative, right? Yeah, and. Um, and I think, you know, you go to pretty much any city now and you're going to find more or less the same big name businesses and shops. There's So it's these places and, you know, um, like places like Russ and Daughters where the food and the place are literally like a taste of that, mm-hmm. of that place. It's a taste of the Lurie side, a taste of New York. Mm-hmm. And so I do think it's. It does make a good gift when you go back to it's a really Colorado, good gift. right? And you, it's not something you can recreate that easily. That's right. Like what you're saying. It really, I mean, I know that word gets used a lot, but it is very authentic in a beautiful way. Well, it's been a really real delight, and I'm so glad we got to chat. Um, and I, I love watching everything that's happening, and we we pick up bagels and locks as often as we can. <laughs> and I like that you're right around the corner here. So, I mean, happy holidays and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you for telling all these rich stories of this neighborhood.